Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. This is the opening module of New Literatures in English and we are going to look at each of these words in some detail. So what do we mean by new literature? How is literature new? As we see in the cartoon here, the father tells his daughter, it's called reading. It's how people install new software into their brains. So this is what literature does. By exploiting the linguisticality of our representational structures, it dismantles the given frameworks to describe, interpret, explain or evaluate something and thus creates the space of forging new frameworks so that the scope of perception is enlarged and contact with reality is renewed through a fresh event of understanding which enriches our experience. Literature, therefore, is, as Kant says, infinite but always new. It is a potential cause of experiences consisting of a system of stratified norms implicit in the work, which can only be realized by the reader. It is neither purely material, nor mental, nor ideal, and neither is it static or bereft of value. It is the result of integrative relations that attempt to restore and enhance the integrity of our experience and the awareness of its significance. How does it do this? According to Viktor Shklovsky, a formalist critic, literature is able to do this through defamiliarization. What is defamiliarization? Shklovsky says in an essay called Art as Technique, the technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar, to make forms difficult, to increase the difficulty and length of perception because the process of perception is an aesthetic end in itself and must be prolonged. Art is a way of experiencing the artfulness of an object. The object is not important. Literature is divided into genres and genres are an attempt to grasp the play of language and pin it down through a generalization. The idea of the general gives us a chance to see the uniqueness of the particular. Genres are produced by a collection of variables in a specific configuration achieving a particular tone. The way in which this collection is put together is the genre and genres are identified by what we call generic markers. Let us go back to Aristotle's poetics. There Aristotle defines poetry as something which, he says, seems to have sprung from two causes, each of them lying deep in our nature. First, the instinct of imitation, which, he says, is implanted in man from childhood and is a difference between him and other animals. Man, says Aristotle, is the most imitative of living creatures and learns his earliest lessons through imitation. The second cause which lies deep in our nature and gives rise to poetry is the pleasure felt in things imitated, which is no less universal than the instinct of imitation itself. We have evidence of this pleasure in the facts of our experience. Let us consider this idea of pleasure because that is what we get from literature. Aristotle says, objects which in themselves we view with pain, we delight to contemplate when produced with minute fidelity, such as the forms of the most ignoble animals and of dead bodies. The cause of this, he says, is that to learn gives the liveliest pleasure, not only to philosophers, but to men in general, whose learning capacity may be limited. Thus, the reason why people enjoy seeing a likeness is that in contemplating likeness, they find themselves learning and inferring and saying 
perhaps? Ah, that is he. For if you happen, says Aristotle, not to have seen the original, the pleasure will be due not to the imitation as such, but to the execution, the colouring or some other such cause. So it is the representation, the imitation that gives pleasure and not the justification for imitation. Aristotle then goes on to define genre. Poetry, he says, are, is of various types, epic poetry and tragedy, comedy also and dithyrambic poetry and the music of the flute and of the lyre in most of their forms are all in their general conception modes of imitation and objects of imitation are men in action. So all of these Aristotle calls poetry despite the fact that they are not all written. He enumerates three different means of distinguishing one kind of poetry, one genre from the other. And these three different means are the medium, the object and the manner or mode of imitation which in each case is distinct, giving rise to different genres. However, when Aristotle comes to the genre of written literature, he seems to say that genres are not fixed. Let us consider what he says. First and foremost, he talks about the art of language. There is another art which imitates by means of language alone and that either in prose or verse. But verse can be of different types and Aristotle says verse may either combine different meters or consist of but one kind. But this has hitherto been without a name. For there is no common name we could apply to the mimes of Sophron and Xenarchus and the Socratic dialogues on the one hand, even though they are written in a similar manner. And on the other, to poetic imitations in different meters like iambic, elegiac or any similar meter. We know that different kinds of poems can be written in iambic and elegies can be written in different meters. And the mimes of Sophron and the Socratic dialogues may be in prose but they are completely different genres. So Aristotle is trying to show us that genre is really not stable. People do indeed add the word maker or poet to the name of the meter. So we have epic poets writing in the epic meter or elegiac poets writing in the elegiac meter. As if it were not the imitation that makes the poet but the verse that entitles them all to the name, says Aristotle, by which he means that even if you do write in the elegiac meter or in the epic meter, it does not make you an epic poet or an elegiac poet. So, even when a treatise on medicine or natural science is brought out in verse, the name of poet is given by custom to the author and Aristotle gives the example of Homer and Empedocles. Neither of them have anything in common but the meter. So it would be right to call Homer the poet and the other a physicist rather than the poet because meter does not define the genre of poetry. On the same principle, even if a writer in his poetic imitation were to combine all meters, which is a medley composed of meters of all kinds, we should bring him to under the general term poet. And so Aristotle says, I think the most important uh, pronouncement that he makes on the issue of genre is this one single line, so much then for these distinctions. However, he continues to make those distinctions and it will be instructive to see how he distinguishes between tragedy, comedy and epic. Poetry now diverged in two directions, Aristotle says, according to the individual character of the writers. The graver spirits imitated noble actions and the actions of good men. 
and the more trivial spirits imitated the actions of meaner persons, at first composing satires, as the former did hymns to the gods and praises of famous men. When tragedy and comedy came to light, the two classes of poets still followed their natural bent, that is, the lampooners became the writers of comedy and epic poets were succeeded by tragedians, since the drama was a larger and higher form of art. So, Aristotle feels that the nature of the poet leads to the nature of his work. In a book called The Theory of Literature, Wellick and Warren in 1948 define literature through two different terms, the extrinsic and the intrinsic. Elements intrinsic to the works of literature they enumerate as biography, psychology, social milieu, ideas and other arts. These are not internal to literature according to them. Those elements which are intrinsic to literature, they argue, are the sequence of image, metaphor, symbol and myth which they consider making up the central poetic structure of a work. However, Jacques Derrida cautions us against paying too much attention to genre. Yet, he thinks of literature as a genre itself. Can one identify a work of art of whatever sort, but especially a work of discursive art, if it does not bear the mark of a genre? Would we know a novel if it was not called a novel? That is the question that Derrida raises, and this mark of a genre is what he calls the genre clause, without which neither genre nor literature come to light. But at the very moment this genre or literature is broached, the end is in sight, because literature cannot be confined to a single genre, and neither can each work be said to fit exactly into a genre as Aristotle has argued. However, different genres have been established across time by different critics. For example, the realist narrative is supposed to be real on the basis of the first fact that it is a first-person narrative. So the person who narrates is supposed to have direct experience of what has happened and his narration is therefore supposed to be true and real. Catherine Belsey proposed this idea in a book called Critical Practice in 1980. This was a book called The Rise of the Novel, written in 1957 by Ian Watt. Verisimilitude means real seeming. So, the realist narrative, in order to make the narrative seem real, uses a first-person narrator. How do we understand genre? Genres should be understood descriptively as based on the outer form, that is the meter and the structure, and the inner form, that is attitude, tone, and purpose with the outer form emphasized. This is the idea that Wellick and Warren propose, and they consider genres to be continually shifting with quote-unquote good writers confirming to but ultimately expanding them. Ralph Cohen, in an essay entitled History and Genre, connects these changes and the shifting of genres to history. He says, and I quote, genre concepts change and decline for historical reasons. And since each genre is composed of texts that accrue, the grouping is a process, not a determinate category. So we have a work like Homer's Odyssey and a work like uh, Virgil's Enid, both being called epics, one deriving from the other, but distinctly different in certain characteristics from the other. So this is the reason why Cohen says genres are open categories. Each member, that is each member of a genre, alters the genre, especially those of members closely related to it. So both the Iliad and the Enid are epics, but there is a distinct difference 
between them because the Iliad provides a model upon which the Enid is written but the Enid changes this model and becomes a new text by expanding the genre. So the process of genre establishment involves the human need for distinction and interrelation. So the same text can belong to different groupings of genres depending upon the person who is categorizing them. Therefore, we could consider genres as literary horizons. Genre can be thought of as an emotive horizon conforming to no stable rules. It is related to other types in the literary system. There is nothing, nothing intrinsic or natural or naturally given about genres. They are made and not born. On the basis of this idea of genre, we will now classify the new literatures that we will be reading throughout this course. And this classification has been done on a threefold axis. First, social locations make for new literature as newer locations become visible. So, identity which relates to social location and psychosexual difference and orientation will give us a set of texts which we can consider as new literature. Then, movements of people, different kinds of movements with different impulses and for different aims like diaspora, migration, exile, displacement, refuge and asylum related to the historical realities of our world will give us another category of new literature. And finally, the mode of transmission of literature is no longer only written. And that is another category of new literature that we will consider, not only the oral, but also the audiovisual and literatures which are related to new technologies. Given this background now, let us consider the way in which these new literatures in English have flourished. For this, we need to see the position of English in the world. Beginning with 1724, King's scholarships were granted to the colonizing nation of England to promote the study of many languages required for service in foreign courts. This study was based upon classical training the aim being governance of the ruled and the humanistic education that was given to people who were being trained for rulership was inseparable from the demands of the bureaucratized state. This comes from Gauri Vishwanathan's book Literary Study and British Rule in India first published in 1989 and reissued again 25 years later in 2012. Let us go back to the way in which English was used for the civilizing mission across the colonies. And here we must mention the name of Matthew Arnold, whose set of essays called Culture and Anarchy gave us the basis of the use of literature for the civilizing mission. Arnold talks about his own essay as one which recommends culture as the great help out of our present difficulties. He defines culture as a pursuit of our total perfection by means of getting to know on all the matters which most concern us, the best which has been thought and said in the world. And through this knowledge, turning a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits. Arnold, in fact, wanted to introduce culture as a source or as a motive force for newness. And he says that our stock notions and habits will be revived and that which we follow now staunchly but mechanically, vainly imagining that there is a virtue in following them staunchly, which makes up for the mischief of following them mechanically. How do we replace the staunch mechanical, habitual following of the past. According to Arnold, that is what culture helps us to do. Arnold relates culture to civilization by focusing 
on what he calls sweetness and light. And sweetness and light are spread by flowering times for literature and art and all the creative power of genius when there is a national glow of light and thought. Arnold makes very clear distinctions between popular culture and high culture. He says that culture works differently from popular literature, religious and political organizations which try to indoctrinate the masses. High culture or real culture does not teach down to the level of inferior classes. It does not try to win them to this or that sect of their own with ready-made judgments or watchwords. So, culture seeks to do away with classes, to make the best that has been thought and known in the world current everywhere, to make all men live in an atmosphere of sweetness and light where they may use ideas as it uses them itself, freely, nourished and not bound by them. So, the civilizing ideas of English civilization may be transmitted freely to the colonies regardless of the ideas that exist in the colonies themselves. And this is the way in which English literature, Arnold argues, will spread the culture of civilization to the rest of the world. In fact, the culture of civilization from England is spread across the world through the literary canon. English literature was introduced as a subject at Oxford and Cambridge through the Newbold report. English literature followed the methodology of classical training. That is, it co concentrated on the three important areas of training, scholarship, philology and historical study. This led to a perpetual search for determinate meanings and interpretation and a categorization of great and little, high and low. An example of this categorization of literature on the basis of civilizational values of England can be seen in the concept of the great and the little tradition proposed by English critics of the early 20th century, F. R. Leavis and Q. D. Leavis. However, the colonial canon is different and separate from the canon in the center and Isabel Hofmeyer has given the example of John Bunyan's 1678 work The Pilgrim's Progress which was first used by colonial missionaries for conversion in South Africa. The writers of English in South Africa used Pilgrim's Progress on their part as an allegory for the nationalist pilgrim's journey to freedom. So Pilgrim's Progress became an inherited text which did not belong to the canon of English literature before it entered the canon of colonial literature. It was from the colonial canon that it moved to the canon of English literature, from the coloni colonizer's literary tradition and translations into the colonizer's language. Edward Said has commented on this movement of literature from the colonial canon to the English canon and from the English canon to the colonial canon in his book Culture and Imperialism. Let us consider the case of English in India as a paradigm case for the teaching of English literature and the effects that it had on the colonized. The English Education Act of 1835 was brought by Lord William Bentinck to reallocate funds given to the East India Company for education according to the direction of the British Parliament. Earlier, the company supported Sanskrit and Persian education and also sponsored publications in these languages. This, however, was replaced by English in the English Education Act of 1835. English became the language of governance in law courts, in the administration and led to the setting up of English schools. This was the suggestion 
made by Thomas Babington Macaulay's famous memorandum on education dated 1835. Macaulay suggested that the company should support English education and stop funds and support to local education except in two places at the Sanskrit College in Banaras and at the Mohammedan College in Delhi. Macaulay pr proposed to produce through education a class of persons Indian in blood and colour but English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. English in India has in a sense followed the dictates of Macaulay. However, local conditions definitely influence the acquisition of English till date. Social position decides the access to English as a medium of instruction. So English is now a tool of class formation and a method of upward mobility. In independent India, the three language formula was introduced. There was an official language which was supposedly used by the state. There was a link language which linked all the different languages across India which turned out to be English and finally there was the local language, the language of the region itself. This led to what Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan has called alienated insiders, the English educated elite. But on the other hand, this also produced a corpus of Indian literature translated into English. Mori Vishwanathan, in the 25th anniversary issue of her book written in 1989, comments on the changed situation in the last 25 years. She says, English can no longer be studied innocently or inattentively to the deeper contexts of imperialism, transnationalism and globalization in which the discipline first articulated its mission. It is no small matter, she says, that Caliban competes de rigueur with his creator Shakespeare as the canonical expression of present-day English studies. This movement from Shakespeare to Caliban presents the change in the hierarchy between British English and English across the world. So we are now in the era of global English, where English is no longer the national language of England alone. This Vishwanathan calls the denationalization of English. And she identifies the twin genealogies of contemporary English. There is one tradition in the colony and another tradition in the metropole. Her example is the difference in the literatures in English between Canada and the United States. And she argues that migrants from different parts of England with different concerns settled in these two contiguous areas and produced thereby two different literatures written in English. English has now become a world language and its impact across the world is what we shall study next. Let us consider our own region, South Asia and Southeast Asia. The ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has declared English as its official language. This is to be noted against the fact that the European Union to which Britain used to belong until recently, does not have a single official language. It has 24 official languages, languages spoken across the European Union. This imposition of English as the official language has been criticized as linguistic imperialism. Critics have stated that this is the result of an orientalist attitude which claims that there is a hierarchy between the colonizer's language, that is English, and the colonized language, that is everything else. So, English culture and language have been disseminated by institutes like the British Council across the colonies. The consequences of this globalization of English are diverse across the world. For example, in Southeast Asia, 
we can look at at least four different responses to linguistic imperialism. Firstly, there is in Malaysia the pro-Malay policy that is teaching the local language to students from the primary level. In Hong Kong too, the protection of local languages has become a major issue. However, in a country like Vietnam, what is known as linguistic surgery has been performed at the introduction level where the local language has been replaced by English beginning from the primary level. Critics have said that challenges to the imperialism of English will come from the soft cultural power of emergent Asian countries like China, India and Japan. Critics have argued that these countries will, on the model of the British Council, set up cultural and language institutes to propagate the soft cultural power and thereby to challenge the linguistic imperialism of English by setting up institutes of culture and language of their own. In Gugi Wathiongo, the Kenyan writer who gave up English in order to write in his own language Kikuyu, points out that the hierarchy of languages, which is a result of the Orientalist idea that the colonizer's language is superior to the language of the colonized, is what he calls linguistic feudalism. Chinua Achebe, in The African Writer and the English Language, wrote as far back as in 1965 that English must be tamed, nativized and actively manipulated to admit its foreign surroundings. This has led to the indigenization of English. And English can be looked at as not one language, but a family of languages with a family resemblance between the varieties of English. This proliferation of variants has been explained by philosophers. If there is a consistent rule-governed structure, it must be treated as a system and error must be defined only in terms of that structure. So the English that we speak in India is a system of its own and any coherent set of language games is a language. There can be no a priori limits to the size of such a set and no minimum set of speakers to designate it as a language. So no normative significance can be applied to the taxonomy. We cannot say that the speaker of Indian English is not a native speaker. He is a native speaker not of English but of Indian English. If we introduce the idea of native speaker, we are going back to the Orientalist idea that the English speaker of Britain is the native speaker and all other usages of English are wrong or in some way non-native. This introduces a hierarchy of language speakers and politicizes language itself. Oxford Book of English Verse a poem written in the Jamaican nation language of which Louise Bennett is the nation poet. To go back to Achebe's prescription for English as a world language from his essay, The African Writer and the English Language. The price a world language has to pay, says Achebe, is submission to many different kinds of use. The African writer should aim to use English in a way that best brings out his message without altering the language to the extent that its value as a medium of international exchange will be lost. He should aim at fashioning an English which is at once universal and able to carry his peculiar experience. In the age of the internet, English is a language which again is the source of linguistic imperialism because the World Wide Web was developed by an English-speaking nation. A survey found that over two-thirds of internet users do not speak English as a mother tongue. So, hyperglobalization or homogenization of the world through English is, or rather was, a threat. However, but by 2012, 
we see that the use of English on the internet declined from 80% in 1998 to 50% in 2012. So hyperglobalization is a threat that is being met by other languages of the world. How should English engage in the new networked world? Let us go to Ngugi Wa Thiong'o to his book Globalectics written in 2015 where Ngugi considers the effect of cyberspace upon language. The lines between the written and orally transmitted, he says, are being blurred in the age of the internet and cyberspace. The language of cyberspace may borrow the language of orality, Twitter and chat rooms, but it is orality mediated by writing. This Ngugi calls cyborality and he says that it is neither orality nor written. Ngugi proposes a new category of aesthetic, the cyborator. Writing and orality, he says, are realizing anew the natural alliance they have always had in reality, despite attempts to make the alliance invisible or antagonistic. The problem has been, he says, their placement in a hierarchy. That is, the written has always been considered superior to the oral. Ngugi, however, suggests network in place of hierarchy. Network, not hierarchy, will free the richness of the aesthetic, oral or literary. New English literatures are new in several senses, despite the fact that they are all written in English. However, this English itself is not one single English. And the English that you use in the area that you are is a fit subject for your consideration. If you look at the e-text, there will be several links where you can explore the newness of new literatures in English. Thank you.